It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Margaret Leinen. Uh, Margaret is the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego and also serves as UC San Diego's Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences and Dean of the School of Marine Science. Margaret is an award-winning oceanographer who has received honors too numerous for me to count today, including most recently being elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She also plays a central role in shaping international strategy for, for sustainable development including serving on the executive planning group of the UN Decade Ocean for o of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Margaret, we cannot wait to hear your presentation. Please uh, go ahead and share your screen. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Fadl and Seth, you too. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the discussions uh, today and to hearing the other speakers. And what I'd like to do is to highlight uh, the how we might activate this smart ocean that we're talking about. Uh, the subtext for this uh, workshop has been uh, the ocean internet of things. And most of us look at, at that in terms of at that phrase, ocean internet of things, and focus on the things, the sensors, instruments, platforms, uh, like in this uh, older description of the Southern California Coastal Observing System. They make it possible for the measurements that we want to understand the ocean and its basins. But here at Scripps, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our legendary oceanographers, Walter Monk, characterized the 20th century as the century of undersampling the ocean. And we certainly want to stop undersampling it in the 21st century. We want enough of those things so that we're awash in data, not the parsimonious distribution of sensors or instruments to answer our tightly honed hypotheses, but the luxurious spatial distribution of continuously operating sensors or instruments that allow us to indulge in inductive exploration of massive data sets to reveal relationships and processes that we don't even know and can't form hypotheses about. And we want those sensors and instruments not only to be able to wander uh, the surface of the ocean, but obviously within the ocean and its basins. And we don't want to have to hover over them in ships. And most importantly, we want them to be able to communicate with each other in the way that we have become accustomed to on land as our devices remind us where our car is parked or more, more importantly, to opaquely communicate be, between each other. For example, to control the environment within a system in a chemical plant without human intervention. That is what I wanna see activated for the ocean. So I don't really see the um, the instruments themselves uh, as a major problem. I actually see fairly rapid development of sensors, instruments, and platforms, the things. But what I'm worried about is the exceedingly slow progress in the development of the internet part of the ocean internet of things, the communication web within the ocean itself and back to us that will allow the activation of, of the ocean internet of things and enable the smart ocean. And because of the extreme challenges for communication within the ocean that we know all too well, the ocean internet is an enormous challenge, a challenge that will take convergence and acceleration. Now, we've had some success with pilots. Uh, for example, the, the cabled observatories uh, that we all know about. Uh, they've allowed transmission of masses of data from the sensors and instruments that are part of the observatories back to shore, and they have the capacity for more. We have systems uh, focused on optical modems that uh, promise to be able to upload large quantities of data if we can get it to them and connect them to a means of transmission. Acoustic systems have the promise of being able to transmit data, albeit smaller amounts of data, across entire ocean basins underwater. 
but none of these pilots scale to an ocean internet. And there is no consensus on what that internet would look like and how everything could communicate and interact through that, that network. Uh, we've made some small steps to, to think about that. And uh, we took a ma actually a big step in 2017 when NATO's Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation announced Janus, the first underwater digital communications protocol, a common protocol for an acoustic signal with which underwater systems can connect. It really took the impetus of the naval calibrations in NATO and the industries that must interact with them to do this. It didn't emerge from our academic research community. And that's why it's so important that the private sector and government users at all levels, as opposed to government research funders, are part of this discussion. Having a communications protocol doesn't make communications underwater any easier, but it does mean that uh, systems that we develop could be more likely to interoperate. There are lots of ideas about how to generate a system. Some of them focus on <clears throat> having, inter having uh, instruments that uh, uh, communicate with uh, surface drifters. For example, uh, seismologists have built on John Berger and John Orchid's experiments with ocean bottom seismometers <clears throat> communicating with wave gliders. Uh, they've also extended that to look at other kinds of data capture platforms. And Bruce Howe and his colleagues in uh, a white paper for OceanOBS 19 suggested a multi-purpose ocean acoustic network that could combine passive and active acoustic monitoring to collect large spatial temporal scale data. Such a net network would have the added characteristic that precise measurement of time between a source and receiver could be the basis of long range underwater positioning and navigation, an underwater GPS, if you will. And if above water GPS is any indication, the potential creative uses for an underwater GPS could result in a similar explosion of capability. Now, there are plus and pluses and minuses to all of these ideas. Some might wind up being the right ideas, but there's been little funding to actually experiment with any of these ideas at more than local to small regional scales to determine what kinds of resources are necessary to start creating that ocean internet to which we could connect out not only uh, similar classes of things, but any things. Uh, another Scripps legend, uh, Roger Revelle, said that great periods of oceanography are defined by new kinds of instrumentation. And in a way, I think that an, a real ocean internet uh, is a kind of enabling instrument. It may of necessity be created in modules, but if we want to create a way to collect continuous biological measurements in the deep ocean, for example, don't we want it to be able to adapt to physical and biological events? And that means we have to measure them and have the, that information interacting. And then there's the accompanying issue of getting information back from all over the ocean. Do we take advantage of existing satellite infrastructure or bend it to our purpose or add to it for our purpose? Do we focus on undersea telecom cables? Do we do all of this? I don't want to wait for another decade to start this, and I don't want to sit by and have to accept something developed elsewhere or for a different community that's kludged together or based on standards that restrict our capability. Finally, I think it's important to recognize that the underwater portion of a communications network itself will provide important data, whether it's optical or acoustic or whatever, or more likely a mix, because the ocean itself will impact the signals in ways that give us information about the ocean's physics, the particles in it that scatter light, or the organisms in it that uh, get in the way of or interact with sound and light. This is a source of information itself. And these signals 
collected as part of the transmission of other data will add to that luxuriously rich data environment that I spoke about. Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, our capability to use that fire hose of data is really important. And for the, the internet of things above water, uh, it's been suggested that how well an industry or individual company uh, utilize the influx of data will greatly determine its competitive advantage and future success. And I think for us, how we utilize this influx of data unleashed by an ocean internet of things and look at the interaction between and among those, those measurements will greatly determine whether we actually understand complex interactions in the ocean a decade from now. And as a result, whether we can understand important questions like how climate change will affect the trophic cascade in the ocean and impact the marine food resources that 2 billion people on the planet depend on for protein. How ocean warming and heat waves and their effect on, on the corals that, that Peter talked about uh, or other uh, um, elements of the uptake of CO2 how that will affect the ability to keep so on. I'm supposed to be done at 12, 15 or something like that. 1251. 12, 12, uh, the, and, and other questions of that sort. And that brings us to the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which kicks off at the beginning of next year. On October 15th, the UN Decade will release a call for action for ideas about how we generate the ocean we need for the future we want. While we won't be able to build that whole internet of things in a decade, I think that we can, in a short time, design that ocean internet so that we know what we're building to and so that we will have what we want for a smart ocean. Thanks very much. No problem. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Margaret, for this very inspiring talk. Um, we had a, we have one, one, 540 viewers uh, as you were speaking, so we got a number of questions. I'm going to try to uh, sample the ones that were most upvoted. One of them was, can we design ocean communication networks that are acoustically safe for organisms? And given your also mm. back as well from the marine biology perspective, your all of your perspectives, what do you think there? Well, uh, that gets to the, the, the um, question of passive versus active acoustics and the, the uh, level of, uh, of energy in the active acoustics. And I think that's a great question that has to inform um, what kind of acoustics we use in a network. Uh, passive acoustics obviously would be able to uh, they, they depend on the noise from the ocean, including that from the organisms. But putting all of that together and, and understanding now what we need to have as a network so that it can interact, the pieces can interact with each other is a real key to being able to not only do it, but do it safely and do it in a way that, that everybody can link in. Great, thank you so much. We have a, a number of other questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much time to, to answer them. But Margaret, thank you for this inspiring talk, for, your, for answering these questions and for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Bottle.